Hi, this is Kashish. Welcome to a new episode of Business Odyssey. Hello, we are Lakshmi and Laura, partners in the journeys of building communities of practice. Thank you for joining us where we focus on exploring the human-centric approach while we consider all the variables that affect it from the learning and development, performance, change processes, leadership and coaching, diversity and inclusion, and other key topics as well. Today, we are joined by Steve Kragl, a visionary and entrepreneur in the transformational field and role when it comes to business, teams, and individuals. Today's topic episode is about culture impacting business, teams, and people. And by talking about culture, we are referring to local culture, organizational culture, and oneself culture. We hope you enjoy this conversation as much as we did. Happy learning. Let's go to the interview now. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Lashmi, of course, uh, for being here uh, in this episode. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. I'm just like I was saying before, I'm going crazy with the topic that we are going to talk about. So let's do it. So what about okay. you, Steve? <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me. This is uh, this is one of my favorite topics to talk about is is culture and diversity and and how it affects the way we don't we just deal with people, but how we deal with people at work as well. And so, you know, as, as I was telling you and, and Lakshmi a little bit about my background. Um, I've traveled all over the world. So the first 20 years of my adult life, I was in the military. And and one of the things I've done from an early age is I've always studied languages and culture and the way people do things in all the countries that I went to um, in, in the military. And, and that benefited me because I learned a lot. Um, but studying just didn't do it. I, I learned more by being with the people in the country where I'm at. And one of the things that I do when I, I'm visiting a country, whether it was as a soldier or Marine, uh, but also as a civilian, is I immerse myself in the country. And so I don't go to the touristy places. I go to, to the little towns and hamlets and villages and, you know, sometimes it can be a little foolish and dangerous because I don't know the area. <laughs> but I think that's part of the, the excitement of it. Um, but I, I like going to the, the small rundown uh, restaurants and and talking to the people or at least attempting to talk to them and eat their food. Because, you know, one of the ways that, that I like to meet people is to eat with them. Because mm -hmm. if you can sit at a table and eat with them, whether you can understand them or not, you develop a connection. And I've connected with, with literally hundreds of people all over the world. Um, and that's how I've based myself. And, and you know, in my, my professional career in the business field outside of the military, um, I've studied the likes of the, you know, I've studied uh, people like um, John Cotter and William Schneider. These are two very heavyweight organizational culture change leaders. They've written several books. Um, and so I've, I've based some of the things that I do on that in that, when I go to different countries and, and observe and learn the language and learn the cultures and eat with them and go out with them, this has made me such, such a better uh, person, not just in my personal life, but also in my professional life. Because when I'm, I'm in a leadership position 
and I'm listening to, to diverse groups of people, I can put myself in many people's shoes because, you know, I've been to Guadalajara. I've been to Sao Paulo. I've been to Bangalore and Calcutta and, and Dali in China and Singapore. I've been to these countries and, and I've been there enough and long enough that I've begun to not only uh, appreciate an empathy for them, but I've lived there many times. You know, I, I lived in Japan for 12 months. You know, I've been to China 15 times. So I've developed a, a, a diverse mindset in regards to not just not just race or religion or gender, mm -hmm. but a diverse culture and the way that people think around the world. Because the way that, that you two ladies think compared <laughs> to me as, as a Texan, not just an American, but even more so as a Texan, <laughs> is completely different. And so the more we learn about different people, the better off we can be, both personally and professionally. And so this has guided my life. Um, and, and especially because, you know, as an Agile coach, I help organizations and, and businesses transform themselves. And, and oftentimes when we think about organizational transformation, we don't take the cultural diversity into consideration. Um, mm -hmm. because it's, you know, they think, oh, this is just organizational culture change. Well, no, it's not because the people are within the organization and they come from different backgrounds and cultures and beliefs and, and there's a wide variety of diversity. And as I, I said earlier, um, one of the things I learned early in my life is uh, I grew up in Eastern uh, United States, uh, a state called Ohio for most, for all of my my pre-adult years, I was born and raised there. When I joined the military, I went to the southern states. And, you know, as I told you, that was such a culture shock. I couldn't believe it because, you know, in, in the eastern part of the U.S., it's it's industrialized. And, and I was raised to go, 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 go. You know, if you're sitting more than five minutes, you're lazy. And so you, you just you work, 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 work. You talk fast. You move. Fast, everything is done quickly. And then I get stationed in the deep south, the deep, deep south. And they talk so slow, it drove me nuts. And everything is such a slow pace that it was a shock to me. And then, you know, and, and, and I experienced it. And then I get, you know, I was in, I was in the military and then I got stationed to, in Japan. And Japan <laughs> is, is very, back, and this is, we're talking the 1970s, okay? So I'm dating <laughs> myself. Uh, in the 1970s, you know, it's, it's very industrialized. It's very disciplined, very strict. Uh, at that time where I was at, I was in Iwakuni. Um, it was, everything was, was, everything had a checklist. Didn't matter. Didn't matter. Everything was do, 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 do. And so that was a bit of a shock. Um, but fortunately, I lived there for a year and I, I immersed myself in the culture. You know, I spoke, I learned how, to, how to, to speak a little bit of Japanese and I loved the food. And, and so I got all of this experience. And even though I was in the Marine Corps at the time, that helped me be a better person. And that helped me be not just a better person, but also better Marine too, because I learned different things. And this happened, you know, I was stationed in Germany for three years and during when the wall was still up. In fact, I was, I just left Germany when the wall went down. So I patrolled that border. I patrolled the border uh, between East and West Germany. And I learned the culture there. And, and, you know, there's a funny story that I remember that, we were walking patrol along the east border, the east-west border, where there's no fence and no wall. There's just what they call, we called them barber poles, because they were poles that were, were metal, metal poles that were very tall, or not metal, but concrete, and they had a, a metal plaque or something on it, and they were painted black, and I think it was black and yellow or something, I can't remember exactly. But we would walk right alongside of an east German Russian patrol. And we'd walk side by side together because they knew our routine. We knew theirs. And we would give, they wanted American cigarettes. 
And so we would, <laughs> if we were caught, we'd get in trouble, but we'd toss them a pack of American cigarettes and we'd smoke together and we'd kind of sort of communicate, you know, unless there was an officer there. Cause if there was a, an officer on our side or their side, you know, you gotta be, <laughs> but I learned so much walking patrol with the enemy. It was unbelievable. And so that concept, and, and then when I became in business, you know, I started reading about William Snyder and, and John Carter, their books and, and listening to their lectures and stuff. And I learned about these things about culture. And, and I really, even though I'd kind of sort of been doing that, because, you know, I've, I love learning new, new things. I actually was able to formalize my education about cultural change. And, you know, w when I thought about culture, yeah, I understood that, you know, culture is things about, you know, your beliefs and your behaviors and, and you know, how you were raised and, and things that, that you do. But, you know, those are all surface things, things that you can see. And, and I, I, I like the metaphor that, you know, culture is, is like a, an iceberg, you know. You see mm -hmm. just a little bit of iceberg on top of the water, above the water. And, and that's the things that you can see. That's the behaviors. That's the language. That's the food that you're eating. Those are things that you can see. But then underneath the water is this huge thing that is the rest of the iceberg. And so when we think about that, that that's our values and our beliefs and our mindsets and, and our assumptions about each other and other people. And so the more and more I dug into that, the more that I looked forward to meeting people from other countries or other parts of a country. And so um, that gave me such a greater understanding of how to become better. Because, you know, as, as someone that was that, that was raised in Eastern United States and then you know, lived in the southern states. I have, and and I've lived in Texas now since 1985. I'm not a true Texan yet because I wasn't born here, and my <laughs> parents weren't born here. But I'm about as Texan as I can be. Um, we think differently, mm -hmm. and so my world travels, and because I'm open to culture. I've opened myself up to understanding people that I'm working with on a on a much better um, uh, level, and it's helped me come become better, and it's also changed the way that I think about stuff. So I could go on forever, but I I think I need to take a pause <laughs> and breathe. <laughs> no, uh, I was thinking about. Um when you bring in all that knowledge and all that experience uh, to the business side, um, mm -hmm. when you are working with a transformation project or a transformation mm -hmm. process, or whatever the name is using, um, how do you actually do? What do you do uh, when you have different mindsets, different cultures, and within mm -hmm. For example, the same company mm -hmm. that has people across mm -hmm. the country with different mm -hmm. cultures as well. So how mm -hmm. do you bring all that to the same level to carry out uh, this transformation project? Okay, well, w within an organization, <laughs> well, let's start with a company first. So, and, 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 and I can use my own company a as an example. So I started my own company uh, a couple of years ago and the company's culture always starts with the founders, always. Mm -hmm. That, you know, so for instance, I spent 19 years working at IBM and Tom Watson Sr. created it. And he's, his influence is still there. Although a lot of his initial concepts are gone, his influence is still there. And his sons, Tom Watson Jr. and the rest of his family that ran the company, their influences are still there. Bring that back up to now, to 2022 now. Culture evolves with mm -hmm. the people, okay? And so 
at the highest level of the organization, so we're going to break it down from the company. Again, the company's leadership at the highest levels sets the pace for the rest of the culture. Okay, so, and, and I'll use IBM as an example because I was there for so long. The culture that I experienced over 19 years was, was initially started by uh, Alu, and then it, it, Sam Palmasano took over, and then Jenny Rometty, and then ended with, um, uh, he took over just before Arvind, I can't remember his last name, but there's two people that took over. One of them, Jim is gone now. But anyways, the culture transformed based on their culture. And so um, within their culture as a CEO, all of their direct reports established and, and worked within that culture because that was their leadership. But then the people that reported to them, they have a culture based on that leader. And so it goes all the way down to the lowest level of, uh, of some cultures. And so when you look at, when I look at, when I go into a company and I'm looking at agile transformation, I get an understanding at the highest level, but I don't drill down too deep. Because that's not what the real culture is, the real hidden culture. Because remember, I talked about the iceberg. There's the culture yeah. that's that's just a little bit on top. You know, that's where you get your vision from. That's where you get your your um, uh, your little posters on you know what we believe. <laughs> that's all up there. You know, nobody reads them. Nobody cares. They're in the hallway. You pass them. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> But the real, <laughs> the real culture is down below, is way down below, where you have like, a, a, let's say you have a project manager or you have a first line leader. Okay, so there's, there's cultures within cultures within cultures and you have subcultures. And so when I'm looking at that, if I'm going in for an organizational culture change, I look at, at the, the second and third line leaders and who they, they manage and lead. Because that is a sub, subculture, and you look at how the teams operate within that subculture, and, and you, you know, because I'm, I'm a trained professional coach, as well as an agile coach and transformation person, is I look at how they, they work with each other. And so the first thing I do is I observe. And part of observation isn't just watching, it's listening. It's listening. And so, you know, when I went through, I'm a coactive coach by training. And so I learned how to listen effectively. Because you can listen with, yeah, okay, it's just a normal mm -hmm. conversation. But, you know, <laughs> Lakshmi, I understand you are, coach, you are a coach. So you understand where I'm going at. And uh, Lorraine, you've been coached. So you probably have experienced deep listening. Um, and so I listen and I watch. And, and I look at not just what people are doing, but I'm looking at how they do. How do they interact with each other? And, and some of the key things that I've, I look for when I'm looking for uh, a cohesive team versus a group of people that are just working is do they take breaks together, number one. When there's a break, do they go with a couple of people from the team or do they go off by themselves? Do they have lunch with each other? Do they have things that maybe they go to dinner together or maybe they, they go to other people's houses together. Um, I had this, uh, this one team that I was working with. I, I worked with them for probably uh, off and on a little over a year and a half and they would go to each other's houses. Um, the leader, uh, he was an awesome guy. He was a former military. So him and I, we clicked right away. That culture, that military culture, as soon as we met, <laughs> we're like, okay, we got this. I understood where he came from and I, and, and he understood where I came from. Um, uh, but he would have monthly dinners, cookouts at his house, the team members, um, they would watch his kids, not because he asked them to, but because they wanted to be with them. They, you know, he would bring his kids and he had little kids. 
and they would watch as kids. And then the team themselves, they would have, uh, I can't remember if it was every two weeks or once a month, they would have what they called uh, movie night. And the whole team, or whoever wanted to, is strictly voluntary. They would go to one person's house or apartment, and they'd watch a movie together. And they'd have popcorn and snacks and drinks. And they did this voluntarily. And so in doing that, they were creating their own culture as, as a team. And part of that cultural aspect of getting to know each other and being with each other and learning about each other, you're also building trust. Mm -hmm. Because in order to envelop somebody's trust and to change an organization, you have to have trust. Because when you trust somebody to that level, then you become part of them and they become part of you. And so that's one of the, the difficult problems uh, working remotely. And, you mm -hmm. know, it, it does, you know, now I, I've worked remotely for years uh, yeah, before, <laughs> before COVID. I, I coached quite a few teams in China and in India and in the United States all at the same time. I never got any sleep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but before I did it remotely, I was able to go there and be with them for weeks or months. So I had an advantage. But now with with what's happening throughout the world, we don't have that advantage. So it's more much more difficult um, to get to know each other at that level so that you can learn to appreciate culture. I'm not saying it can't be done because I've done it. Um, mm -hmm. But it takes a lot more effort. Um, and it takes it takes um, opening yourself up. You know, because right now I hear a lot of people that, that say, well, you know, I don't want to turn on my webcam. It's early. I don't have my makeup on. I'm, I'm in my pajamas <laughs> or, or, you know, whatever the reason, you know, people uh, are, are using, you know, I've got kids and animals crawling around me. Um, but it's very difficult to help people with culture and, and learn other things to, to improve your diversity if you hide yourself. And so that's one of the things that I talk about when I'm doing remote training is in order for me to appreciate your culture, I have to see you. And I have mm -hmm. to, because remember, culture is visible and invisible. I can watch and learn all about the way you communicate as long as you have your web camera on. Because remember, communication isn't 100% verbal. The vast majority, and, and I learned this a, a long time ago, back in, in when I was in school, when, when I was young, they taught us nonverbal communication. Mm -hmm. But they taught us, because I lived in the eastern part of the United States, they taught us the nonverbal communication of people that lived in the eastern U.S., not the rest of the country. Because nonverbal communication is region specific. Mm -hmm. And I learned this in India. Because there are certain movements and gestures in Calcutta that I learned that did not apply in Bangalore. And Lakshmi's <laughs> laughing. She, she, she's on mute, but she's not. Am I telling the truth, Lakshmi? <laughs> Okay, you know what? You steal the answer. You know, I had this question out there in my mind that later I'm going to ask Steve. Like, I am curious to understand your experience, Bangalore, Calcutta, and Delhi. You know, how was your experience and what was it? And here you are, you know, you're sharing it. So <laughs> I know. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and it's more than just food. And, you know, one of the things that astonished me about India, what, 300 languages i'm like oh my god i have trouble learning one damn language let alone 
And so my experiences in India was, unfortunately, were short. The longest I ever stayed in India was five weeks at one time. Um, but I did go back to Bangalore twice. So that 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 was good. But I, I spent five straight weeks nonstop in Calcutta. And I learned so much, so much. Um, not just at, at the, the languages, and but also the body movements and 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 the food and the way that you treat each other it's like oh my god i never had an idea i mean i knew differences in the united states you know we we speak differently like some parts we say pop other parts we say soda um but it's the same thing all over the world it's not just in the u.s it's not just in any although i will admit um in regards to language and foods, India's got it. I've never experienced so much diversity in language and food anywhere else in the world. Anywhere else. Uh, um, China comes, doesn't, well, it doesn't come close with languages because there's basically two different, well, three different styles of, of languages in China. Uh, the food is, is regional, but it's huge regional. It's, it's, not so, I mean, in, 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 uh, please Lakshmi, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, <laughs> in the regions of India that I went to, that I traveled to and worked in, even within a hundred miles, the food was completely different. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. 100%. <laughs> yes. And, and, and I love food. I just, and I love spicy food too. So wow. I had a, I had a blast in China and in India, and the the people that knew me that that took me around, um, they were challenged to find food that would make me cry because it was so spicy. <laughs> it worked a couple of times, but see that's how I learn culture, and that's how I appreciate it. So the question is, how did I associate that to my work, to organizational mm -hmm. culture? Because when I meet each other, I had this little exercise called "Who are you." And I use it in my classes, in my training, and when I meet pe when I meet people or I'm working with teams for the first time, is um, I want to know about you as a human being. I don't care if you're a PM or you're a developer. I don't care about what you do at work. What we're going to do right now is we're going to talk about each other. What's your favorite food to eat? Um, what languages do you speak? Where have you lived? Um, what would you do if you had one superpower? What would that be? And so I ask all these different questions because that gets the thing rolling for me. And and so the more I can help people talk about themselves and how they were raised and their backgrounds and, and their experiences, mm -hmm. that help us under, understand each other. And it helps us come, to be, come together as a team because oftentimes organizational change resistance is because of our background. Mm -hmm. Is because there's something within that change that doesn't feel good for us for one reason or another. So that's one of the, one of the reasons for resistance to organizational change. The other resistance to change is a lack of trust. And so if you remember what I said earlier is for me, I build trust by learning more about people, by spending time with people, by eating with people. And I had a good lesson on one of, on one of my first trips to China. I think it was about my third trip to China. I was trying to hire a person to become one of my agile coaches she was incredible. Oh my God. I wanted, I wanted her to work with me so bad because she was really good. And her boss just would not let me hire her because he said, no, she's one of my best. I'm not willing to give her up. And I just couldn't find a way to do it. And, and I kept trying and trying and he kept saying no, no. And, and I even got my vice president, uh, involved <laughs> and he said steve i don't know what we could do but he's fighting me too <laughs> and so one day um the the people i was working with said that um, steve he's invited you out to dinner he wants to he wants to have dinner with you 
So we went out, and he wanted to have dinner uh, um, in a pub. Well, they don't call them pubs, but it, it was a it was a it was a club. It was a, a restaurant and, and a drinking place in in, in Dalian, China. And we were talking, and um, you know, the suits were off. We were relaxed. And he started ordering beer and and what he called baiju, which is like a liquor, a strong liquor. <laughs> and we were talking, and I didn't talk business at all because that was one thing I learned is that um, yes. when you're invited to dinner, you do not bring up business. If they want to talk about business, they'll let you know. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. But this was just a, a meet and greet. Let's relax. Let's talk. And. Um, he saw, I have a tattoo on my arm. It's, it's a Marine Corps tattoo from the military. And he saw that. And he looked at me and said, you know, and, and he asked me about it. And I told him, you know, I spent 20 years in the military. And um, he said, my son is in the Singapore military. And so I said, oh, we clicked. There was that click. He never, he himself had never served, but his son was active duty. And he was very proud of his son. And so we talked about his son, and we drank, and we ate, and we, we had consumed quite a bit of alcohol by that time. And he leaned over, he looked at me, and he called me Stephen, Stephen, <laughs> instead of, you know, I like to be called, my, my real name is Steve, my formal name is Stephen, but I like to go by Steve for short, less formal, and he said, Stephen, I can only do business with you if you're willing to get drunk with me and trust that I will get you home. And we continued to drink <laughs> and we drank. And I don't know how I got home that night <laughs> back to, back to my hotel, but he made sure I got back to my hotel. And the next morning, late in the morning, <laughs> he called me into his office and he said, okay, Steven, let's talk about this lady. And we talked for an hour and a half, and he said, all right, I will agree to let her transfer to your organization. And that was their culture. You can't mm -hmm. do business if you, you're not willing to go drink with them. And, and at least that's what he told me. And he yeah. demonstrated that. Mm -hmm. And so now I didn't try that with all the other, I, with the other executives that I worked with, I, because it would it'd be inappropriate for me to do it. But that was just a, an example of how his culture was so ingrained into what he believed. And as soon as I took that step to, to understand and live within that culture, that opened the door for me. And, and even though I'm not an IBM anymore and he's not an IBM anymore, we are still in touch with each other. He's now back in Singapore. He is doing great. Uh, you know, we've talked about each other's families and we have become friends because mm -hmm. I took the, I took the effort to put myself in a position and, and deal with his personal culture. So at work, and, and this was, this involved work because I really want this. She was a great as a coach and I wanted her, I wanted her to be on my team. And so we have to think about what are we willing to do to help an organization get better, to help a team get better? Now, there are some things that I will not do. I will absolutely not do certain things because it violates my values and my morals. Mm -hmm. But going to dinner with somebody, that's important. You know, breaking bread is always a way of, of getting to know someone. Um, and so we have to evaluate what are we willing to do and not willing to do. And if we're not willing to do it, we, we need to, to be respectful enough and let them know that, you know, I would really like to participate in this event, but this is how I feel. If there's mm -hmm. something else we can do or consider, then let's do it. You know, it, it's, it's like, um, you know, I told you I love to eat extremely spicy food. That's part of who I am. I even I even take you know food challenges on on levels. I've eaten the hottest peppers in the world as a challenge because I love doing that. <laughs> Some my wife thinks I'm nuts. She thinks I have a death <laughs> wish. <laughs> um, but this is something that I do. 
but I would not force someone to do that with me to become part of, mm -hmm. of my circle, to become part of my network or for me to trust them. Okay. Uh, it, that's just like, uh, I'm a carnivore. I love meat, but I would never ask or expect a vegetarian or a vegan to go mm -hmm. to a steakhouse in Texas if they came to see me. I wouldn't do that because that's disrespectful. Um, and, mm -hmm. and, and so there are certain things that we have to understand. Um, but I have gone to vegan restaurants in China with, with some of my friends because, well, I, I also eat vegetables, so that's cool. Um, <laughs> but it's all about respecting each other. And if you're not willing to do certain things to get close to them, you know, be courteous enough to explain that to them. Um, and we have to understand that just because we're talking about a work culture doesn't mean it doesn't involve our personal life. Mm -hmm. Because it does. Because, you know, one of the things that I, that I teach people is that what happens at home, you bring to work. And what happens at work, you take home. And so be aware of that, be cognizant of that, especially if you're in a leadership position and you have a high performer who all of a sudden changes and they're no longer high performer. You have to ask yourself what's happened. And that's where one of the things that I do is I teach leaders how to coach. That's where your coaching skills and knowledge comes into play is you get with them one-on-one -on -one and, and, and have a non-threatening, safe, honest discussion where you find out, hey, you know, you were really at the top of your game, but I've noticed some things have slipped, you know. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about that? You know, what's going on? Because sometimes all we need is for someone to care enough to ask what's happened. And when mm -hmm. you express that true, honest concern about your employees, they're going to trust you and that's going to help your organizational culture change even better. Because if they trust you, they will trust you enough to change the way they work. Even though maybe they might be afraid because maybe they feel they don't have the skills because that's another part that causes organizational culture to, fair, to fail is the fear of failure and the environment to fail. And so if they have the right kind of leader with the right mindset, then that will make organizational culture change even better. Because culture, as most everybody knows, it takes a long time to mm -hmm. change culture. We're not talking weeks and months. We're talking years. You know, I've yet to see a successful agile transformation that took less than five years. A real cultural mindset transformation. Yes, you can change the way you work. You can change your practices. You can change mm -hmm. your tools. But that doesn't make you change. It doesn't make it sustainable. The only way to have a sustainable change is for it to change here in your heart and in your mind. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to shut up again. <laughs> Maybe because you said it before we asked. <laughs> uh, I was thinking about. I told you I love this topic. <laughs> uh, Last me if you want to, to talk. Sure. <laughs> So, um, Steve, when you were introducing yourself, you mentioned diverse mindset. Okay. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. tell us more about that. Okay. Well, a diverse mindset is where you take into consideration all of your experiences with other cultures, with other people. Um, and it, it, it's like I was talking about whenever I'm working with people from across the world and I've worked with multiple people and multiple teams from, from, you know, I, I worked with one team where, where, you know, it had 10 people and none of the people were in the same region in the world. They were all separate. 
And so when you have those kinds of, of diversity of, of not just of not just languages and, and races and genders, you have diversity of thought. And when you have a diversity of thought, you know, in the United States as a young child, I was raised a certain way by my education system. And I've noticed that's the same thing in every country, in every part of different countries I've been to is the way you were raised and how to think both by your education system and by your community and your parents changes the way you think. So you have a diverse way of thinking based on your culture and your geographics and your demographics. And so I take all of that into play because I've taken the time to learn that. And when I have teams, and I love to have teams that are extremely diverse because they think differently. They challenge each other and they also learn from each other. And for me personally, when I have a more diverse group of people or teams that I'm working with, that means our innovation is just supercharged because you have this diversity mindset, because you all think differently based on how you were raised and what you learned both formal and informally. And so that's why I, I love working with groups of people that are scattered throughout the world. Because if it's just, if, if my team is consists of 10 old white guys from Texas, we're going to think basically the same. And we're not going to get anywhere because we're going to stay in the same rut. So, yeah, I'd like to be challenged. Thank you for that question, Lakshmi. Now, our audiences need to understand that, you know, we talk so much, the diversity, inclusion, so much is out there, but somewhere the essence gets missed out. At least it that's does. my perspective, perspective. Mm -hmm. so, sure. you know, helping people understand. Yeah, because yeah, it, it's more than just race and gender and demographic. Yeah. It's everything. You know? Very true. Very yes, um, you mentioned one word that resonates with me. Uh, because it's part of who I am, and mm -hmm. you said about curiosity. Um, so how do you um, how do you know when to be curious about someone about something, and when do you pass um, that curiosity to the other oh, okay. side to be curious enough? Uh, to you. Oh, that's, that's easy for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's and and, and this for, this comes from and Lakshmi should will probably recognize this, seeing that we're both coaches. Is coaches have to be curious about everything, and so there isn't a single thing that I've experienced that I wasn't curious about, whether it was curious in a good way or curious in a kind of leery way. It's like. <laughs> Hmm, I'm not so sure if this is okay, but I got to know about it. You know, it doesn't mean I have to be an expert in it, but I have to know about it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, okay. it, it's, you, you should always be curious whether it interests you or not. I mean, there's been a lot of things that, that um, I would rather have not learned, but when I did learn a little enough about it, it made me better it made me understand certain things better. Um, and so I can't think of a single thing in my life. And I, I had a rough early life. Uh, I grew up extremely poor. You know, uh, I had, you know, my father died very young. I, I only met him once. I had a stepfather that was abusive, alcoholic. I didn't like that environment. But when I was an adult, I had I wanted to learn about it. So why was he such a brutal? And, and I'm not going to say the cuss word I want to say, but <laughs> why he did that thing. And, and so I learned about it. I learned about alcoholism. I learned about rage. Um, you know, I didn't want to learn about war, but I did because I was in the military. I had to. You know, I volunteered to be in the military. There were some things I didn't want to learn about 
but in order to survive, I had to learn it. So we have to be curious about everything, whether whether it pleases us or not, because it makes us have a better understanding. You know, we talk about empathy all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Put yourself in other people's shoes. But sometimes other people's shoes have holes in them and they're mm -hmm. not comfortable to wear. But if we only put ourselves in people's shoes that are comfortable, we don't really learn some of the lessons we might we we might find useful. You know, we mm -hmm. don't understand what it's like to be brutalized if if we don't take the time to to walk in those shoes. We don't understand what it's like if you never grew up poor, you don't understand what it's like to have to steal to eat. And so if you're not curious to understand that level of survival, you're not going to understand what it's like. Yeah, you may say, well, I'm em I, I have empathy for people and I give them money. But do you really understand? Do you understand what it's like to be so poor that you're living on the streets and that you have to steal food? Mm -hmm. Because that's a, that's a level that is very difficult to understand. You know, I hear people, you know, beat their chest. Oh, they're criminals. They need to go to jail. Well, do you know why they did that? Do you know that they were kicked out of their home and they've got children to feed and they can't find a job? And so in order to feed the, their children, they went and stole from a grocery store or maybe they broke into somebody's house to steal something. I'm not making excuses for it, but it's a fact of life. And, and I've been to some very poor countries and I've seen the poverty. And it has changed my life so much. And it's made me a better human being because not only do I can I see it with my eyes and understand it with my mind, but I've been there and my heart goes there because I've been in those neighborhoods. I've been in those areas, you know, there's, there's certain, there's certain parts of, of Calcutta and Bangalore that people don't go to. And if, if people like us went there, it would break your heart, but you don't know that feeling unless you've been there. And so when we talk about being curious, that's what I'm talking about. It's not just about the good things to be serious about, but it's about the things that's going to make you just cry out of, out of sympathy and, and despair. But there's people that live that every single day, and we have to be aware of that so that we can really help people. Because throwing money at people isn't the solution. Mm -hmm. And anybody that's lived in that situation, and like I said, I grew up extremely poor. I know what it's like to go without food on occasion. But I don't know what it's like to go without food every single day. And so when I've seen that and lived in that and walked in those streets and down those alleys, even though the people I was that took me there said, don't go down that alley, something bad could happen to you. And, and Lakshmi, I'm sure you you know what I'm talking about, the places I'm talking about. That's what curiosity is all about, is being curious about things that you, you are interested in, but things that's going to break your heart because it makes you a better person so that you can have an understanding. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm going to shut up because I can <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, like I'm sorry for getting off topic, but that's, I, I'm passionate about that. It's okay. Uh, it's okay. So I don't know what to say right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, if we are going back to the to the topic, I mean the mm -hmm. culture side, 
-hmm. if we have to um, like connect the dots mm -hmm. uh, between uh, all the variables that affect that, I mean, yes, the human being is there, uh, the curiosity is there, your passion mm -hmm. for what to do as well. Yep. And the trust. Mm -hmm. And yes, uh, many people, I think, I think that's my perspective from, uh, from my side of the world, still not seeing that um, the background. And when I'm talking about background, I'm talking about um, your culture, about mm -hmm. the city you grew up, your family, et cetera, et cetera is not affecting your the company culture. So when the two can, um, mm -hmm. the, the two, the cultures, the organizational mm -hmm. culture and your own culture mm -hmm. plays together and there mm -hmm. is some difference between them. There are people that still do not understand why mm -hmm. and they see just, okay, the, uh, this is having, um, this person is having just uh, personal issues and that is not adapting to the organizational change or the mm -hmm. organizational acid or mm -hmm. this is mm -hmm. not, it's not a cultural fit. So we must right. let him, that let that person leave the, the, the company. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, it, yes. And that's where you have to, that's where your values come into play. Mm -hmm. You know, because every individual has their values. And again, your values are based on your culture. You know, how you grew up, who your parents were, your community, everything about you is formulated as part of your culture and your values. Because you can't separate the two. You know, mm -hmm. I, at least I believe you can't. Because values has a lot to say about my culture. I have certain values that are based on my culture. Um, and so, for instance, um, you may have to make that decision. Um, I've, always, I've always said that, you know, two of my, my most important values is integrity, being mm -hmm. honest, and courage. And courage comes into being able to speak up for your values. Courage is being able to speak truth to power. And so those are my two main, in fact, that's that, you know, the model of my company is fortitudo et integritas. It's, it's Latin for um, courage and integrity. It's as mm -hmm. part of my company, part of who I am. Anybody that knows me really well will tell you that's true about Steve. He has integrity and he's courageous. And sometimes that's gotten me in trouble because <laughs> I have I have no trouble speaking truth to power. And sometimes I've lost jobs because of that. Sometimes I've I've definitely lost a lot of promotions because of that when I worked for other companies. Mm -hmm. And so when your personal values come into play against the culture of an organization, you have a decision to make. Mm -hmm. And that decision is what's more important to me and my family. Is this value worth losing my job over? Or is this value worth me staying in this company? And so, you know, I, when I, I teach values and culture to people, I say, you have to draw a line in the sand on what values you're willing to cross that line for and what will what values you will never cross that line for. Mm -hmm. And then you have to acknowledge the consequences of the of your values. And so there are some values that you can have like a blade of grass. They can be blown by the wind and they can be bent and they can go around in here and there. But then you have to ask yourself, are these really values? Are these really important to you? And other values, if you try to bend them like a, a, an old stick, they'll break. Mm -hmm. So you just have to think about what is important to you as an individual 
and your family. Because remember, when you stand firm in your values, especially at work, if they go against the organizational values and culture, and really, let's just change that to organizational culture, because organizational values change depending on leadership, is what's more important to you and your family. And you need to have that discussion with your family. Because if your values aren't in alignment with the organizational culture, you may have to quit or you may get fired. Well, that's going to affect your family. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And One way so or <laughs> some people, unfortunately, have to go in line and bend their values because they don't see any other opportunity to support their family. Or maybe they're not confident enough in their skills to get another job. And so you can see these people at work. They are depressed. They, uh, you know, when they start getting in their 30s at the same job, they start to hunch over. They start to have droopy eyes. They're sad. They're sad because they've had to give up their values for the security and safety of their family. Mm -hmm. So... To say that you got to stand firm in your values for me is easy. My children are adults. My wife is completely independent. She, you know, we're in a great place. She doesn't need me. She's never, she's never needed me. <laughs> she's always been independent. You know, but if anything, I needed her more than she needed me. Um, so it's easy for me to sit here in my situation and say, stand in your values. Mm -hmm. I don't have six little kids at home and a mortgage and car payments and medical problems. Mm -hmm. But I did have, well, I didn't have six kids, but I had two kids that I had to raise. I did have mortgage payments. I did have car payments. It's all what, what you think you can handle. And the thing that's got me through the hard part is I always knew my self-worth. I always knew that if I had to quit a job or if I got fired from a job, I was confident enough to know I could always get another job. I've never had that problem. Um, and and any time that I might have slipped into that feeling, I had my wife standing behind me saying, what the hell are you thinking? <laughs> you're, you're good you know and then she would remind me of the things i've accomplished in my life and, mm -hmm. and so i'm fortunate because i have an amazing partner I and mean, she was my high school sweetheart we dated in high school before i joined the military it's like she's been with me from day one you know i was 17 she was 16 we've been together and so it's you know I give her a lot of credit because she's been my backbone many times because she's always telling me, you've got to stand up for yourself. Mm -hmm. And so that partner and that family member is extremely important, especially if you're in a situation where you're, you're in work and your, your values are being pressured to do things mm -hmm. that you might not that you wouldn't do under any normal situation. So that family is vital. You got to have a backup. You got to have someone that's going to to help you stand when the wind is trying to blow you down. And I'm going to shut up again. <laughs> I have to shut myself up because you guys aren't stopping me. <laughs> Um, uh, yes, um, I mean, uh, all that background, uh, when we are working, um, because we are working with people, sometimes uh, it's not considered at all. So, um, just, uh, I, I don't, not sure about say, this, I mean, 
because it's not exactly what I'm trying to say because mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but uh, I would say not all people um, if we are talking about uh, not all leaders or senior managers um, get involved enough with mm -hmm. the people they work with mm -hmm. to get to know this side to not just to help them just because I mean, there is a human being working with you, uh, yeah. but uh, to help them as well and the organization to move forward mm -hmm. and to grow. Yeah. So how do we work? I mean, the, I think I think the question here is um, how do we work when we are facing this kind of situation, different levels, mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. will say, and how do we get uh, to the point that we say, it, I mean, it's even that way. How do we get to the point that, okay, we say enough is enough. Mm -hmm. uh, we have done so far. Mm -hmm. uh, we have done this well. We have, mm -hmm. we don't want to do this. Uh, we mm -hmm. want to go there or there or whatever it is. So what should we do or what or how we do, how we deal with that kind of situation when we find in front of that. It's not just about empathy. It's not just about um, be curious. It's about mm -hmm. something else, I think, too, okay. based on that. Okay. <laughs> so let me reframe it just to make sure I understand what you're saying. Is, yes, um, <laughs> it was too long. <laughs> you're, you're with it. Oh, no, no, no. I just want to make sure I got proper understanding is you're in a team and the team wants to go a different direction and perhaps a leadership doesn't want you to do that. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Mm -hmm. OK, so there's this thing um, that I like to do is is I like to have the teams. First of all, you have to understand leadership. And for many years, I didn't understand executives. I didn't like executives, honestly. <laughs> I, I basically thought they were useless. Um, <laughs> but, oh, I'm sorry. But then, <laughs> but, then, but then I got in a position where I was coaching executives, professional coaching. I was doing leadership and executive coaching. I had to help. Um, so I got a better understanding of them. And one thing that we have to, not just executives, but one thing we have to understand about leaders is um, we have to meet them where they're at as team members. And they sometimes, I'm not going to say always, but sometimes leaders don't want us to try something um, because we don't present it in a way that they can consume. And so one of the things that I, I talk to teams about is say, you know, you talk about you want to do this and you you go to your leadership and they just deny you. Well, how did you present that to the leader? So, well, we just told them we wanted to do it. So, well, that doesn't help them very much. So let's do this. Let's create an experiment. And in an experiment, you identify your hypothesis. Here's my hypothesis. By doing this experiment, I think we will achieve this, X, Y, Z. And when we achieve X, Y, Z, this is how we're going to know. So you're going to have to have metrics to prove that you achieved that. That's mm -hmm. number one. So you, you have your hypothesis. You have your metrics to prove success. Mm -hmm. And then you show what the return on investment that's going to be. And so you got the what, that's your hypothesis. You got the metrics to prove your, to either prove it or disprove it. You got your return on investment. And then you've got to be able to do it in a short period of time, like a couple days or maybe a week or two. And you also have to tell them what effort it's going to take in regards to how many people, and, and I do not call people resources because yeah. resource is something you consume and throw away. So it's people and consumable resources like laptops or desks or whatever it is you need to do that experiment. 
and you put that in a, in, in a format, mm -hmm. and then you do a formal presentation to that leader. And speaking as I, I'm an executive of my own company now, that's how I want things presented to me. Show me that you've thought this out of what you want to do, why you want to do it, how you're going to do it, how you're going to measure success, and what's the cost going to be in regards to time, people, and equipment. And if you achieve this, what's the return on investment? Because I'm going to have to make an investment of my own money because that's how managers feel. Managers, leaders, they have a budget, and they have to make sure that that budget is, is not only quantified but qualified. And so if they're going to spend $10,000, to, for you to do an experiment, they're going to have to get something back in return. And the answer is not $5,000. <laughs> okay. So what I'm so reading, that, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No. But what I'm reading is uh, communication. That mm -hmm. your language to the, to, mm -hmm. the, to the audience that we are talking about. Yeah, exactly. And if you're familiar with design thinking, um, yes. One of the things I also do when we're talking about leaders and stakeholders, do a persona. And in that, in that persona, make sure you understand how they work, what keeps them awake at night, what are their pain points, and what do they need. Because if you can meet their needs, take care of their pain points, and help them sleep at night, you're going to get whatever you want. <laughs> yes, definitely. And, yes. and that's part of our problem is we don't take the time to look at things from the perspective of the leaders. But the leaders do that to us as well. And so then when I'm working with the leadership, I do the same thing with them. Mm -hmm. You know, how is this going to affect the team? Well, I don't know. I got to do it. So, well, why do you have to? You know? So you do the whole thing. It, it's, you know, you think about the circle of life. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's a complete circle for a reason. There's no beginning. There's no end. We're all in the circle of life, whether it's personal or at work. We all need each other. We all mm -hmm. need to understand each other. We all need to work with each other. And so as a, as a change agent, as a transformation agent, as an agile coach, it's my job to help close that circle because oftentimes there's a big gap between the leadership and the team or the leaders and the leaders. And so my job is to help close that gap so that we can become that circle of life. Can you hear the music? Yeah. <laughs> But it's true. It's true. Because we are so separated from each other. Teams are separated from leaders and leaders are separated from each other. It's we have to bring together. And, and that's when you can tell that everything is working so smoothly. You know, I, I've had the pleasure of, of working with some extremely incredible people. You know, like that the team I worked with that I told you about. You know, and the leader that was former military. That was That was probably one of the best teams I've ever worked with in my life because their circle was complete. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's. So we have to understand our leader when we want to do something, meet the leader's t needs, my communication by communicating with them what we would like to do and how it's going to benefit them, the organization and the company. Mm-hmm. I have a couple of questions. I don't know which sure. one I'm going to ask you first. Go um, for it. Um, okay. At the beginning, you said um, that to build trust. Um, of course, it's easy when you travel and when you meet a person, uh, mm -hmm. like, yeah, having conversation face to face, one on one mm -hmm. conversations. But when you are doing this remote, mm -hmm. it's a difficult process, or not just a difficult process, takes longer than that. How do you build that? 
if you can. Uh, That's you the do. first question. <laughs> so so you, you, you think about face to face, you can go to lunch with each other. Can you do that remotely? Yes. Really? Yes, you can. Yes. Can you have a beer together remotely? Yes. Or any kind of beverage remotely? Can you eat together? Yes. Can can you share a bit of your culture with other people remotely? Absolutely. I think so, yes. Yes. Absolutely. I, now, I haven't experienced this myself, but I've heard about. So Indians have a holiday called Holly. And and they use colored powder. I don't know what it's made of. Lakshmi, you'd have to tell me. But I've seen, I've heard of groups that got together remotely this past year and they did. Now, they couldn't color each other. They couldn't throw this colored powder or whatever on each other, but they did it with they got together a couple of people in their family and they were on zoom and they did it to each other and everybody did it together and they showed, they came together and they celebrated it. And from what I heard, again, I didn't see it. I just, people talked to me about it and they said it was one of the best times they ever had. And it was all done on zoom. Wow. I can't, I can't think of a single thing other than the physical act of touching people that you can't do with Zoom. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've watched YouTube videos of orchestras, musicians come together and play music, beautiful music on Zoom. And they're all across the world. And they have a conductor. And, and the conductor is conducting the music and they're playing in their homes all across the world. Hmm. When I was still at IBM, one of the last things I did before I got, before I retired and got resource laid off is they had a, a thing for the kids because of COVID. Is, uh, so one of my jobs is I'm a Lego serious play facilitator is I played Legos with kids all over the U all over the world, really, not just the US, but all over the world. And the kids had their Legos and I had, in fact, I got one of my little Legos. I always have Legos nearby, <laughs> always, always. Um, and we played Legos. And what I would do is I would show them how to build things and they would just start building. And I and then there would be free time where they would just build whatever they wanted and we'd share and the Zoom was on and the parents were supervising because you know, who the hell is this Steve Crego guy? <laughs> but, but, but the parents would get in the floor with the kids and they would be using Legos and we had a great time remotely with Legos. So if you're going to do something remote that you used to do face to face, Think about it and then think about what you would need for everyone to do it. And then just coordinate. Again, it's all about communication, coordination, collaboration. You can do almost anything. The only thing you can't do physically is to hug people you care about. Mm -hmm. However, you can do a virtual hug. Oh, yes, yeah. that's true. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's all about being creative and innovative. And again, when people say, well, I'm not creative or I'm not innovative, it's you are, but you're afraid. Mm -hmm. It's tracking everybody is creative. No matter, you know, you don't have to be able to draw a Picasso. You don't have to be able to play a note on an instrument. You just have to put away your fear and let yourself be free. That's all. That's all. <laughs> and you can do anything. Mm -hmm. So that's how you can resolve the problem of being face to face and missing that face to face interaction. Is mm -hmm. just change the way you do things. Be creative. You know, one of the things I did. So this this Lego duck. 
there's a there's a, a a game I play in my fundamentals course uh, called Duck the Plan, and you would build different ducks. And this has to do with being innovative and and iterative, and incremental versus waterfall. If you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I took I took this duck, which is 3D. It's you know one two three four. It's like seven six or seven pieces, and I did 2D versions in Miraw. And I created a physical game and turned it into a virtual game in Miro. And I'm not an artist. I, I, I don't have Photoshop. I don't have Adobe Illustrator. I did it in PowerPoint. And I just thought, okay, let me look at this. All right, what, what do I got to do to create this into a 2D image? And I just tried it. And, and it took me months because I was afraid because I had expectations of, well, I can't do it. How can I do this 3D? And, I, and, and it was all about my fear until one day I said, why do you need it 3D? Put it 2D. But it took me months to get to that point because of my fear. And once I overcame that fear, I was able to do it. So, you know, I learned from myself because I have a lot of fears. You know, I have a fear sitting in the corner over there. I don't know if you can see my guitar. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I used to play guitar a lot when I was young. Um, it, it's because I had no fear. And now it's like, you know, playing in front of people is like, oh, my God. <laughs> you know, I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, and so, you know, it's just we have to find ways to overcome our fear. Because you can do Almost everything. Mm -hmm. Almost. Like I said, you, you can't. Yes. There's something about physically shaking somebody's hand or hugging. You know, I, I've spent time in, in Latin America and Latin American people are huggers. They're huggers yes, and they're kissers. Do. The first time I went to Brazil, I got kissed on the cheek. I'm like, I'm married. <laughs> 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 and, and you know i was in sao paulo and then the second time i went to sao paulo i got kissed on both cheeks and i said i'm only married to one woman but why did you kiss me on two <laughs> and so i learned something about culture in sao paulo you kiss on one cheek and rio you kiss on both cheeks i haven't been to argentina yet so who knows <laughs> but we are yes uh like yes I mean, if you come here, the first thing you will receive, of course, you have, uh, you can stay at home. Of That's the first thing. And then the barbecue and then go out. Uh, that's the first thing. That's the three main things. But of mm -hmm. course, you will receive hugs. You will receive mm -hmm. kisses. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. I would like to talk as well. So, yeah, and, and think about the symbols that we've learned to use remotely. We didn't have this before mm -hmm. COVID, did we? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we we've we had developed our mm -hmm. own nonverbal communication symbols, where we can show that we care about people. Mm -hmm. You know. Yes, that's it. Um, I can't remember the other question that I wanted to ask you right now. Um, uh, but uh, I will say that uh, to, to like when you have, um, okay, I remember when you have, when you were talking about um, like to close the gap uh, between the different levels. Um, I mean, what's your experience when you have, uh, when you have working with bureaucratic organizations mm -hmm. and when you have with flat organizations, I mean, mm -hmm. the, the gap, what's the same, what's different, what's, what's there and how do you resolve? And, okay, I will try to remember the last question, <laughs> but that's the that's the next. Okay. So what do you think of, tell me what you think a flat organization is first. Um, for example, I, I work with uh, IT companies mainly that mm -hmm. there is just a CEO mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And then you have all the team that, yes, mm -hmm. they play different roles, but that's it. I mean, it's the CEO with them, working with them, communicating with them, and helping them um, to run the project, the, I mean, the daily had the, the sprint, whatever they need. And um, to get involved, not just um, professionally, but as well as the personal side mm -hmm. of the team. And then you have the other organization that I think both the, the three of us know most mm -hmm. of them. So when I'm talking about flat organization, that's the one I'm working with, for example. So mm -hmm. um, okay. yes, just the CEO and the team. And the team. So then the team or teams, mm -hmm. depending on whether it's one or many, and, and if there's no leadership in between, I would assume it's a very small company. Like a yes. Um, you just invite them out. You just say, hey, we'd like to have a, we're going to have a team dinner and we'd like to invite you. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, any kind of a, a truly flat organization like what you just described with just a CEO and then you have the teams, it's a small group of people anyways. You know, I, I would venture to say it's probably less than 50. Yes, they are 15. Yeah, yeah. And they are, uh, I mean, they are in the same country, but they are in different countries as well. So they have yeah. that kind of cross-cultural team. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, but how do they well, do that? Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, first of all, you do the, the virtual thing, like what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But also ask the CEO if, if he or she is willing to set aside some money once a quarter or once a month. Mm -hmm. So everybody. And from what I've seen of startups, they usually do that. Because startups, you've got to be very, number one, the people are going to be working really, really hard because they are so small um and, and so bringing everybody together is, is difficult and so a lot of the startups that i'm familiar with they do have at least quarterly get-togethers but they also do things you know, especially you know i don't know too many startups that's that's distributed all over the place usually they're all concentrated in a single location um but even if you're you're split up you know, talk to the to the the leader about having people come together. If it's not that many, have them come together once a quarter. I mean, it, you know, startups become regular sized companies because they come together. Not only do they work hard, but they play hard, and they set aside mm -hmm. time every time they they have an accomplishment. They have a celebration because it's so vital and so important and it usually has a huge economic impact on the company. And so it's, it's usually just a minor thing to bring everybody together to celebrate. Um, and I can't speak for, I'm sure there's some startups out there that, that don't do that because they don't have the money or maybe the leadership doesn't, you know, they're more concerned about growing and, and becoming, you know, even richer. Um, but, you can always tell a leader by um, how frequently they want to get their people together off site. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of leader you want to work with because they understand that when your people work hard, they need to be rewarded. And just because you get a paycheck isn't reward, it needs mm -hmm. to be something extra. And, and a lot of times, yes, you know, we all like money. We like our bonuses. We, we like our, our swag, you know, our, our gifts and stuff. But we also like to get together. Most people, I mean, there's some extreme introverts that are like, nah. Yes. I'm going <laughs> to stay home and pet my cat. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> that resonates with me a lot. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm thinking about that. Yeah. But, but for the most part, people do like to get together as a team for a team dinner. And, and it's really incredible for the leader to be there so that they can celebrate and they can, and the team can see the team leader celebrating with you say, Oh, look, he's not a robot after all. 
he <laughs> likes to have fun. Or she, <laughs> she likes to have wine in public and isn't afraid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So, yeah, it, it's, I mean, what's the worst that could happen? You invite them and they say, no, I'm sorry, I don't have the time. You tried. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, you or, have 50 50 of possibilities yes. mm -hmm. of chance. But, yes. but the worst thing is not to do anything. Because mm -hmm. maybe they're just waiting for someone to invite them or to suggest, or maybe they don't think about stuff like that. Maybe they're the introvert. And the team says, hey, we'd like to have a team get together, a celebration. Would you be able to fund it and attend it? Mm -hmm. And here's what we're going to do. This is how much it's going to cost. <laughs> Again. <laughs> Again. Yes. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm, I mean, the, uh, is, if we are going to close this conversation, um, I don't know if last me, will you agree with this? Um, but it will be interesting to note what are, um, your key learnings in your journey around this 20 years, 20 plus years of experience. What are those um, that you can share with us and with the audience that you think are not just um, a life uh, that's, how do I say this? Um, that are, uh, that affected your personal life as well as your personal life that you think that they added value to you okay okay um i think the the most important <laughs> thing that has affected my life that i've learned is that everyone no matter who you are what you are where you're from has something that can contribute to your personal growth and as long as you're open and honest and receptive to learning from people that you don't know, then that is the greatest gift that you can give to the world. Mm -hmm. So that's what I have learned is it doesn't matter who you are, what you are, where you are or what your culture is, or your background, I can learn from you. And in learning from you, I can become a better human being. And hopefully, you can learn something that will help you become a better human being as well. Mm -hmm. So th that's the most important thing I've learned. That's what has made me who I am today is the fact that I am open and willing to learn from anyone. And remember, not all learning has to be positive. I've learned things from some pretty wretched people mm -hmm. that has benefited me because it's made me an overall better person, positive and negative, yin and yang. Mm -hmm. OK. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. So, um, Lashmi, I don't know if you want to. No, to no, I, I'm, I'm thinking it. I'm thinking in this, and I'm like, you know, it's always a wow. It's, it's been from the time yes. we started, it's been just a wow. And, you know, yeah. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Yes, I would say yes. Um, Amazing talk, Steve. Um, definitely, I'm thinking about all, all the chat. And um, okay, uh, it's like I have a lot. I have a long thought process <laughs> to have uh, after this uh, this talk. Um, I'm really enjoy it. Um, so, bye. so thank you very much for inviting me. 
and thank you to you for your time as well uh, for being here with us. And um, okay, I will say uh, that we are finished our talk. And I have to ask you um, if you can share or if you want to share um, where people can reach you out. Okay, uh, probably the best way to reach me is on my LinkedIn page. And I don't know if you have it, but I can send it to you if you like. Uh, in fact, let me do this real quick. I sure. can put it in our chat. Sure. And we get we will share it uh, in the episode description as well. So yes. Okay. So mm -hmm. I just put my LinkedIn in our chat session. So I think you got it. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that that would be the best best way to reach out to me is to send me a private message on LinkedIn. Because I'm I'm always on LinkedIn, always checking it. Okay. Great. So thank you so much, both. Uh, have a Great day ahead, Steve. Lakshmi, enjoy your night, your evening. Okay. Thank you for staying and... up so late, Lakshmi. I, I really appreciate it. I oh, know uh, I'm a late nighter. Uh... So, <laughs> is it like, like, are you in India? Yes, and I to Bangalore. So. Oh, yeah. okay, okay. So it's about it's a little after nine nine p.m. there then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Well, it's it's a pleasure meeting both of you. Uh, thank you again for inviting me. I, um, I know I talk a lot, but this is a topic that I love to talk about. So I really appreciate you inviting me and the time that, that you gave me to um, talk forever. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely. No, see, we, are like, yes. we are humbled and honored mm -hmm. to, to listen to you and even yeah. the audience too. And this is definitely one of the the best desk, I would Ooh. say, you know, if I may use that word. This has been much. so so wonderful. Yeah. I appreciate yeah, it thank you much. So thank much. you both yeah. very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. Y'all have a great day, great night, great week. Mm -hmm. sure. Thank you. The so same. Much. Okay. All right. Okay. Ciao. Thank you. Bye. Mm -hmm. Thanks to everyone who makes these podcasts possible. In particular, thanks to the guest speakers and to you who are on the other side listening. If you liked it and were able to learn something new today, we invite you to share it with your entire network. We also invite you to subscribe to our different channels to follow our latest news. If you are interested in being part of these series, you can apply by clicking on the link that is in the general presentation of the podcast. Until next time. A special thanks to the boys, Kashis Wadbani.